Lisa and me. <laughs> uh, my talk today is about associative ne networks, uh, and these are associative networks that I'm trying to generate in my music theory courses, beginning with uh, the introduction of a physics lab experiment in either music theory one or oral skills one during the first several days of classes for my incoming freshman students. Uh, what I hope is that the labs, they are going to require deliberate action on the part of my students, and that, I hope, will lead to a generation of memories that are useful in the understanding and memorization of future music theory topics in my curriculum. So first, some background on the subject. Here's kind of the agenda for today. I'm going to have an introduction, and then we're going to actually take time doing these physics labs, and then we're going to regroup to kind of talk about uh, some of the psychological theory. So I already do this, and I have been doing this for several years in my Oral Skills 1 class. Now, Oral Skills are the skills that musicians use to identify solely by hearing intervals, melodies, harmony, rhythm, and any other basic elements of music. And all the students here, as well as institutions across the world, have to take music theory and also some type of oral skills. Now, it may be called uh, ear training and musicianship, along with a harmony class. It has different names, but it's all the same thing. It's learning the materials of music and then learning how to identify those materials by hearing. Um, so this is all fine and good. I've been using these labs to de uh, develop community right away on the first day or two of classes. The students have to interact, and they're doing something fun and enjoyable develop comfort between my students as soon as possible because they're going to need each other for the next several years. Uh, and also to use up, especially in oral skills, what is otherwise a dead day for me. Because um, prior to utilizing the physics labs, I would always do the introduction syllabus, you know, buy, buy this textbook, get this course packet, and then that's all I would be able to do in oral skills because they need to have background in theory before we can actually dig into the oral skills concepts. They have to have definitions from that. So I have kind of a dead day. So now I have a pre-lecture video that they watch that introduces first what is music theory, and then the next thing they watch about is melody, and then I'm able to do these labs on um, pitch and sound. So before I really flipped the way I was thinking about these labs, these student outcomes were that students would learn properties of sound, they'd learn the basic anatomy of the inner ear, and then they'd be able to connect uh, the properties of sound with what's going on in their inner ear, and then how that is being uh, picked up and interpreted by the brain. So they have this immediate interdisciplinary connection right away on the first day or two of classes here at the super interdisciplinary institution. So last summer, I had the honor of being able to teach one of the interdisciplinary courses that everyone has to take, Rhetoric and Critical Thinking. And as part of that class, I used a text by Diane Halperin called Thought and Knowledge, an Introduction to Critical Thinking. And just an intro uh, for Diane Halperin, she's an American psychologist, she's the past president of the American Psychological Society, she's a professor at two institutions, she's the Dean of Social Sciences at the Keck Graduate Institute in California. And her research, uh, it covers a vast array of topics, but what I was really focused on were the topics that zeroed in on her research in scientific reasoning and intelligence. And the fact that reasoning intelligence and intelligence can be taught. So in the book, it talks about a definition of critical thinking. And this definition is the use of cognitive skills or strategies that increase the probability of a desired outcome. And one of the first things I do with my students is actually do a word association with images for this definition so that they have a memorable experience that involves both reading the phrase, seeing pictures, it involves Napoleon Dynamite, um, and then they're able to repeat this definition to me very quickly uh, and they understand what it is. But most importantly, it's thinking that is purposeful, reasoned, and goal-directed. In order to be able to think this way, you need to know two things. One, how to learn, and two, how to think clearly. Well, I've had a lot of experience, you know, I, I've gone through three schools, 
uh, you know, I have bachelor's, master's, PhD. Somewhere along the way, I learned these things. And we, we assume that all of our students coming in the freshman year are going to know how these things. But I checked with my students. No one has taken a class called How to Learn 101 or How to Think Clearly, an introduction for dummies. Uh, <laughs> no one is actually sitting in a class learning how to learn. It's assumed that they're going to pick up these skills along the way. And so what I ended up doing with the use of this textbook during my rhetoric and critical thinking class is that I made sure I was demonstrating to my students how to learn, how to study, how to read, how to outline. And I realized that while all, you know, all good teachers innately do this, Thinking about it in a much more planning-oriented manner can really help um, make you make your students understand even more. So, when we talk about critical thinking, there are a couple of uh, terms that are really useful for this. One, system one, and system two thinking. Some of you may know this as fast and slow thinking, or uh, there's there's a book by Kahneman, uh, thinking fast and slow. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I checked the other day, it's still on the top 20 or 30 in several lists on Amazon. Okay? So if you want to understand about thinking fast and slow, it's a much more digestible way to, to get into the topic. Kahneman, uh, also just a uh, background on him, he's an Israeli-American psychologist known for his work on the psychology of judgment and decision making, as well as behavioral economics, and he was awarded a, the 2002 Nobel Prize uh, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. So that was in 2002. I had the pleasure of getting to hear him speak at a conference several years ago. Uh, so another way that this has kind of led me on this path is that I've, I've been able to experience his lecture, um, see the ideas of System 1 and System 2 thinking in action in Hal Kern's book. So System 1 is fast. It's fast thinking. It's intuition. It's automatic, effortless, but here's the catch. It is associated with years of experience. So when I was you know, a student taking a test, and it's multiple choice perhaps, and they're like, oh, my gut says to go with B. Well, why is your gut saying, saying that? Is it because you studied very carefully and deeply, and you're very comfortable material, so your gut has an informed decision that it's making? Or is it the opposite? System two is slow. It is effortful. It is deliberate. It is thinking. It is the type of thinking that is critical thinking. We weigh evidence. We evaluate risk. We calculate probabilities. We judge credibility. One of the ways that I make my students do system two thinking is they have to complete a decision-making task, and I give them a spreadsheet that is already laid out. It will mathematically calculate based on the several options that they could make for the decision. What am I going to major in? The criteria that they have for that decision. Do I want to make a lot of money? What's the job market like? Do I want to go with passion? Do I want you know my passion for this thing? And they go through and weigh it, and they have to slowly go through that decision, and then it'll spit out you know a number, and then we can interpret that number in three different ways to help them make a decision. But it makes them sit down and think about it very carefully. System two, that slow thing, uh, system two informs, slow thinking informs fast thinking. This is why a medical doctor working in an ER in the midst of a horrible emergency can make a snap decision that is correct because they have had years of education and residency and experience. So that's what I'm going to try and incorporate with these labs. Make them do slow, methodical, follow the steps. This is a cup, you know, that kind of thing. Here's a string. Uh, the other thing that goes in with these physics labs, uh, talking about critical thinking, is memory and memory acquisition. Memory is the acquisition, retention, and retrieval of knowledge. Okay. But memories are stored in associated networks. And these are spider-like organizations of information uh, in which closely related topics are located near each other. And the main idea is if you trigger one topic, it's going to trigger several other things. So here's a great example. Of course, me. I have to think pet. Cat. I'm going to think cat. This is, this is, and literally, this is how my brain, the voice inside my brain sounds like this. Cat. <laughs> Fuzzy. Four-legged. What's my cat's name? My cat's name is Max. Max is a part of my family. You know who else is part of my family? 
family? My sister, Noelle. She's in college. She's made friends other than me. She's a psychology major. Cat or pet to psychology. Okay? That's the kind of associative network that can happen, which is why you can be thinking about one thing or having a discussion about one thing and end up somewhere else. But it's these very close networks that I want them to be able to realize that I'm creating for them. So music theory, sound is part of pitch, is part of melody, and then I can go from there. Compose a melody. Melody is full of intervals. Okay. So, I mean, I got to teach the class, but I, I learned a ton teaching the class. Um, I learned there's a recall advantage to information that is well known, familiar, prominent, recent, and vivid, and dramatic. In order to create these associative networks, my instruction has to instill these recall advantages into my students' brains whether or not they know that I'm trying to do it or not. <laughs> Therefore, me, as an instructor, I have to create experiences that can be recalled and that can create these associated networks. Now, again, we, you know, good instructors are thinking, yeah, I'm going to go from topic to topic. I'm not going to introduce, uh, say, in my class, a Neapolitan chord, which is uh, you take a second scale degree, you lower it by a half step, and you build a major triad on that before they even know what a triad is. I'm not going to jump around to these topics, so there has to be flow. So now I have new learning outcomes for my, for my physics labs. They're going to learn the properties of sound. They're going to learn about the anatomy of the inner ear. They're going to connect all these things, make these interdisciplinary connections. But I'm going to make sure, as they're doing that, that I'm engaging them in visual, oral, and tactile experiences that develop memory of the concept that I can then draw upon when new concepts are introduced. And I call this the Mary Poppins effect. You know, if they have fun, you know, in every task that I've done, there must be an element of fun. Uh, you turn it into a game, you have them play with ping pong balls or salt or sound waves and all, you know, things like that. They're going to remember that. So then I say, well, this relates back to that first or second day of classes when we played with that ping pong ball. What was the point of that? And they'll be like, I don't know, I just Snapchat it and sent it to my mom. That's another <laughs> nice thing. I'm not going to lie. I really like, they get the cameras out and they're videoing what they're doing and sending it back to their family and friends right away. And they're like, I'm in college. I'm okay. It's okay. Look, I'm having fun. It, everything's going to be fun. I've got to, I mean, do you guys, yeah. <laughs> Michaela's like, I definitely sent that to my mom. <laughs> So on the first day, I'll have my students watch a pre-lecture video. It's called, What is Music Theory? Because they've enrolled in this class and <laughs> have no idea what it is. Uh, and, and actually, it's hard to define, but it's the study of the structure of music. And that structure includes melody, harmony, rhythm, uh, form, texture. And the first thing I like to dig into is melody, which is the result when sounds of definite pitch which is a word that a lot of people just assume people know. You know, a musician coming in, they're going to know what pitch is. They've all seen pitch perfect. They know, they know what pitch is, right? Uh, uh, sounds of definite pitch are arranged in a manner that achieves a musical shape or contour. And that musical shape is perceived as a unity by the brain. And then the melody is going to be the horizontal aspect of music. I did that right for you. Always looking this way. So... So if I do, um, do a dare a female do a drum of golden sound. If I go from there, there's a couple of things happening. First, I am singing a melody that I replicate off the step, and then I keep doing that. <laughs> okay, that's the horizontal aspect of music. But I'm also not that one. There you go, playing chords underneath it. That's the harmony. That's the vertical aspect of it. There's rhythm going on. Long, short, long, short, long, short, long. How are you going to notate that? Um, there's going to be a form to that song. It's going to have the verse and then the chorus, and then a bridge, and then the verse, and then the chorus. Uh, and the texture of this is very simple. Vocal with accompaniment. It's called homophonic. Pitch. So this is where I get into the labs. It's the highness or the lowness of a tone. Do a deer a female deer. This one is lower than this one. Or this one is lower than this one. 
Um, and I'll do a little test, like, okay, which one's higher and which one's lower? But scientifically, it's described as frequency. All sounds have a vibration. This is the periodic motion of a substance. So picture you've just plopped uh, a beautiful jello mold onto the plate, and you go like this. Okay, you've got this motion of the jello moving back and forth. Um, but we can't see it. I go, oh, do you see the, no, that'd be pretty cool. I guess if I had some fog going up here, you'd be able to see it. Um, but what happens is, uh, every time that an instrument is played, and you know, there's a string that's being plucked, or I am singing, there are all sorts of mechanisms that are going on, but the main thing that's happening is that the air around that string is vibrating. And it creates a periodic motion, okay? So something that is regularly shaped. There's an increase and a decrease. So each increase and each decrease is one single sound wave. And once you know that, you can understand that, well, if I squish a bunch of sound waves together, I'll have more vibrations happening per second. Okay? Do I have that here? Okay. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. So that's an increase in frequency. That term that I introduced before. Frequency is the number of cycles of second, the number of sound waves are happening every second. If I increase them and there's more happening per second, the pitch is higher. If there's less happening per second, the pitch is lower. If the sound wave is incredibly tall, that's called amplitude, it's louder. If it's incredibly tiny, <laughs> then it's soft. Okay. Those changes, that motion in the air, um, the compression and rarefication, so when it's squished together and then comes apart, squish apart, it's more compact, and then it's less dense, okay, the air particles. Gets to your ear, travels inside your ear, hits the eardrum. The eardrum continues to vibrate, passes that on to the small bones. There are little hairs in here that vibrate, and eventually it's picked up by a nerve ending. And those nerve endings are passed into your brain, and your brain then interprets interprets that as it's a note, and it's recognizable. It gets ah instead of some kind of random noise instead. So here we go. Frequency already went over this. The number of sound waves uh, cycles that occur every second is measured in hertz. More cycles equals a higher pitch. Fewer cycles equals a lower pitch. And that's basically the introduction they get. Often I use a Bill Nye the Science Guy video for this. It is fantastic, and they love Bill Nye. I love Bill Nye. Uh, and he has a whole episode that's just on sound. It's fantastic. Uh, and this will get us into the first lab, which involves ping pong balls. So, in and around the area, uh, you will find bits for both of the labs that we're going to do today. The first thing you need to know is that it, there's a very delicate piece of string in there. So I'd say remove that first so that it doesn't get all, all uh, tangled up. And even if it's a little tangled, as long as you're going to be able to freely hang it, it's okay. If it's horribly tangled, then I'll get you a new piece. If you're sitting where you're not near and you want to participate, then just snuggle up next to someone. There we go. <laughs> or steal. There we go. <laughs> so for this lab, you're going to need the ping pong ball. Mine is yellow for you. The piece of string. Some tape. Some of you have some uh, washi tape in your cups. Some of you don't. Just once you're done using it, just pull off two, you know, one or two inch pieces of tape and pass it on over to your neighbor so that they have two pieces of tape. Do you have anything? Yeah. Okay. And what you're going to do is one end of the piece of tape you'll use to tape uh, the string to the ping pong ball. I've actually poked a hole. I have a needle in here. I just wow. don't want. I don't want that extra. So just. You know. Yeah, just tape one end to it. Some of you may find you have ping pong balls that already have tape on them from previous experiments. There we go. And then tape the other end to the edge of your desk. It needs to be hanging freely. Okay. 
or or the desk next to you, you know, it just needs to kind of like this, hang it freely, and let it kind of settle so that it's not swinging back and forth, and you're going to need to get close to that ping pong ball, so make sure it's in reach. Now, you also have a tuning fork and a striker, which you are not to strike yet. <laughs> Let me just say a couple things about the tuning forks. It looks like it couldn't hurt you, but in, at no time today are you to put this near your glasses, or your teeth, or anything you value. Your cell phone, okay? Don't put it near the glass, all right? Now, you have a striker uh, that I've given you. It's a hard rubber piece that you will hit the mallet against. So just not involving the ping pong ball at all right now, just practice striking the tuning fork onto that surface so that you know how it works. Ooh, I have a mallet <laughs> Only put it, don't, don't go putting it all the way up next to your ear. We'll talk about that. I guess I'm not even close to my ears. Well, that's fine. Just, I like hearing you. Just like gently, okay? Like I need to walk into a bell. Okay, you all have a general idea of how to use the tuning fork? Okay, great. We are going to, without striking it, touch the tuning fork to the ping pong ball. Don't do it yet! What do you think will happen and why? Nothing yet. Nothing yet? Why? Because it's not. We didn't do anything to the tuning fork. Okay. clumsy and poke it. Yeah, unless you're gonna, you know. Okay. Anyone else have another hypothesis? You want it to vibrate? What? It'll vibrate. It'll vibrate? You think that touching it, it'll make the, uh, the tuning fork vibrate? Okay. Any else? Okay. So, without striking the tuning fork, Move it very slowly and carefully until it's just touching the ping pong ball. <laughs> I'm <laughs> stop swinging. <laughs> Uh, like, this one says 440. 
Like that larger? This one's like, eh, yeah. 493. Like, 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 they would have like a 220 or a 290. Let's do that. What are the numbers on the tuning forks? Uh, probably has something to do with frequency. It's the hertz? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so these tend to, oh, I'm going to borrow these other numbers. Then you're interested in this frequency. These tend to show it really well. Humidity and temperature is an issue, so I'm assuming 
altitude is also, you know, physical change on the instrument that it would. So basically, I don't know what you said. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Field trip to Denver. Yeah. And we'll do this. Okay. So here are my follow-up questions. We all, some of them we've already answered. One, can you see sound? Not, not every day. Not, no, not, not normally, not every day. Okay. Why does the ping pong ball move? Vibrations. Okay, the vibrations from the tuning fork, they're, they're hitting. Now, what I really hoped would happen is that the vibrations would be so awesome from the tuning fork that you could just hold it next to the ping pong ball, but it's just there's not enough motion there, okay, for it to happen. The first time I did this, that's what I really wanted to happen. It's not going to happen. But it's still showing you that this is vibrating. And you notice when you held it there long past you could when you could hear it, it was still moving. So even though, let's say, the amplitude of the sound wave had decreased so much that you could no longer physically hear it, it was still vibrating. You still can't, you couldn't see it vibrating anymore. But the ping pong ball was still moving. Wait, well, yes? How do we know that the ball wasn't moving because it was bouncing off of the tuning fork? It wasn't a vibration, it was just, you know, action and reaction. Bumping into something, moving away from that. Well, the initial one is, right? Yes. The initial one, and then after that, it's going to depend on where it's where it is in its cycle, right? The, the tuning fork moving back and forth. And I think that's why you would sometimes get, it would lightly bounce, or it would hit at the same time, right? Think of a head-on collision versus a rear-end collision. Um, there's going to be a greater force in that head-on collision, and that's going to make the ping pong ball swing out more. Is that? Is that? Okay. We're getting to the edge of my, my physics knowledge. All further questions will be answered by that side of the room. <laughs> Uh, so, generally it's a periodic motion, but it, but again, if you're hitting it, yep, okay. Uh, can sound move objects? Wow. Okay, so let's think about this for a second. Think about that inner ear. Okay. Sound waves, the air is moving, okay, compression, refraction, hits the eardrum. Eardrum starts vibrating. What if the amplitude is huge? What if it's incredibly loud? Okay, vibrates more. Does anyone know what's inside the cochlea? No, not you. Hair? Hair. Is it actual hair or is it just called hair bubbles? They're stereocilia, kind of a hairish like thing, but they're embedded in almost like a gelatin. Okay, Vibrates. and they're like rice shaped, and they can very easily bend or break. So if you listen to music or sound, or jet engine, something like that, very high amplitude, you can do permanent hearing damage to yourself. And which is why you don't go uh -huh, and <laughs> put it right up to your ear. <laughs> Another thing is, uh, well, we'll talk about this in, in, in a second, but you also don't touch it to other um, items that may have the same frequency or similar frequency to it. We're going to talk about that in a second. So when you're when you kids are listening to your iTunes and your Spotify <laughs> and you have the headphones up really loud, be careful. You can harm your hearing. And this is exactly why. You can break those little hair balls. And your high, your high frequency ones are first. They're the closest ones to the window. They're the ones. So that's why you lose your high frequency first. What causes tinnitus? Oh, a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other thing. You ever, you know, you go to a rock concert and your ears are ringing for a while? That's another thing. That can be permanent. That tinnitus can be permanent. Um, Yes, so be careful. Same thing, you know, in rehearsals, or if you play piccolo. They, there, are, there are ear specific uh, earplugs you can purchase for, for these things. Oops, there we go. We should tell Les that. She knows that. Okay, good. She knows that. Actually, uh, Miss Sprinkle just purchased a custom piccolo. Wow. I know, wow. Okay, so for our second lab, there are a couple extra 
extra definitions that we are going to learn. We already know sound, vibration, frequency, uh, hertz, great. There's this thing called natural frequency. That frequencies, uh, frequencies at which a structure will tend to vibrate when subjected to certain external forces. So these are all molded and shaped to resonate at a very, uh, let me not use that word, to uh, have a frequency when they are hit. That's your external force. Okay. Resonance is the phenomenon in which a dynamic force drives a structure to vibrate at its natural frequency. So some external force put upon this could make it vibrate. What could, what could you possibly do to make it vibrate? <laughs> sure! <laughs> what, what if you don't have that option? You can't strike it on anything. Okay. With, with, with the things we have today, we can't make that happen. But what can happen is something called sympathetic vibration. And that's the phenomenon where a formerly passive structure, in this case it's going to be this string right here, is going to respond to external vapor vibrations and start vibrating it at itself. Because I'm going to play a note up here, not the higher, but it's going to be within the same harmonic uh, um, series. So, see if I can get this to work. I'm going to pluck this string, I'm going to play a C, I'm going to dampen the string, and then you should be able to hear the one an octave lower vibrating. Yeah, and if you get that tone generator app, you want to crank it as 
loud as possible. So maybe you want to just practice that for a second, make sure you got it going. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, to use tonal energy. Yeah, if you're a band nerd, tonal energy, that will work. But that's a paid app. You have to pay for that. I mean, <laughs> is that really an insult? No, no not in this room. And you want a pure tone. So sometimes the tone generators have a picture. You want the one that looks just like the vibrating sound wave that I, that I showed you. And it needs to be able to be sustained. Okay. The other thing you're all going to need is a teaspoon of salt. Oh, I want to show you. No, we use salt for a specific reason. Because that's how you get hands. Do you want hands? You're having issues. You need some help? Okay. So take the rubber band off, actually. Because you want to thread it over the top. Okay. And then, yeah. All right. Yes, I'm going to give you the salt on top of your cup. Do not let the cup and the cell phone interact yet. This is important.
and play the pure tone. What do you think will happen? Okay, do it, do it. Don't change the pitch. Just keep it whatever pitch you got it set at. Timpanists, professional timpanists, they'll tune their drum by singing to it. 
you'll see them, uh, you know, they're tuning, they're tuning, and they lean down and they sing. They have a uh, uh, and they sing. And if it sings back to them, they know they're in tune. Or they're crazy. <laughs> yeah, or they're crazy. Yep. Now, what biological structure that I've been throwing up here on the board does it remind you of? Eardrum. Yeah. My eardrum. Okay. So we are tympanic membrane. Everything is connected. It's amazing. So what happens if you're listening to music loud enough or a sound that's at a specific frequency? Yeah. Okay. You bust your eardrum. No good. So let's return, now that we've had fun, return to our learning outcomes. Yeah, great. Did you learn about the properties of sound? Okay. Did you learn a little bit about the anatomy of the inner ear? Okay. Did you connect the idea of the sound waves to the inner ear, to the part of the brain? I actually, I just learned the part of the brain the other day. And it's gone. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't have a large enough connection <laughs> between that experience. Um, did you have the Mary Poppins effect? Did you feel like, oh, that, that was super fun. Okay, now if I go, all right, you remember when we learned about uh, pitch and sound waves? Well, guess what? We're going to learn how our modern scale was created. And in order to do that, we're going to have to talk about Pythagoras. And I'm going to have to pull up my monochord. It's a single string. We're going to have to figure out what the frequency is of that string and then how to divide it in order to get the intervals that we're most commonly using music. So what I really hope, and I'm going to show a, a smaller cross-section of this, and what I'm going to try to do now over the next couple of years is work out this music theory associative network that I hope that my students will begin to do. Here's music theory in the middle and then the main components of the study of music theory, I know it's hard to read, melody, form, uh, harmony, texture, and rhythm. And this was just, I very quickly made this using the first three semesters of music theory. And if we look at kind of what we did today, so music theory, we learned about melody. Melody, we learned about pitch. When we learned about pitch, we learned about sound. When we learned about sound, we learned about the inner ear and the brain. But we also learned about hearing health. And you know what? When I'm thinking about hearing health, I might be in the practice room, or I might be in my lessons, or I could I need to make sure that I know about the sympathetic vibration so that when I'm practicing, I'm not playing too loud or I'm, I'm in rehearsal, I don't hurt my ear. Um, and then you can see frequency is going to go way off over here, um, but this is also going to lead sound, pitch. I'm going to learn about accidentals, which is going to lead to chromaticism, which then Music Theory 3 is all about chromaticism. Yeah? On the previous the texture, is that related to timbre? Texture is related to timbre. Texture is the division, uh, sorry, is the combination of the layers of the music. So there's three main types of texture. Monophony, which is me singing a single line here, or if we all sang it together. When a whole crowd sings the Star Spangled Banner, that's monophony. Okay, that's a single line. There's polyphony, multi -line, multiple lines all moving and all important at the same time. Uh, when you think of chant, Renaissance music, that's polyphony. And then there's homophony, which is a melody with accompaniment, which is what you're thinking about uh, for most, most musical forms that we're looking at. Oh, hmm? What about antiphony? Antiphony? So that's going to be uh, part of the form because it'll be going back and forth between maybe it's a monophonic texture and a polyphonic texture. So in this part of the form, it's just, just the women singing one single line together, and um, uh, then the whole congregation sings together. When you think of singing a song in a Catholic church, that's antiphonal, antiphonal music. So if you want lesson plans for the two activities we did today, uh, if you want to see the slides for the presentation so that you have the graphics, or if you want the picture of the associated network of music theory, um, you can go to this website, and there's a QR code as well. Um, the, this is a, a process for me right now. Like I said, I, I, I was kind of doing it, but now I'm doing it with much greater purpose and making sure that I'm giving my students the learning experiences that they need and then I need to make sure that I'm referring back constantly to make sure 
that they can see how this network is growing. And I think what I may do is eventually get the whole thing printed and put on the wall of the music theory room and so 